So it's now my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker, Dr. Ingrid Indy Burke. She is the director of the Haub School of Environment and Natural Resources and the Wyoming Excellence Chair at the University of Wyoming. Before coming to Wyoming, uh, Burke was at Colorado State University, where she was a professor, university distinguished teaching scholar, and co-director of, of the program in ecology. Her research and teaching focus on rangelands and forests in the Front Range, where she studies the effects of management and weather on carbon and nitrogen cycling. Burke has been designated as a National Science Foundation Presidential Faculty Fellow, a National Academy of Sciences Education Fellow in the Life Sciences, and she was recently elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She received her PhD in Botany at the University of Wyoming and her BS at Middlebury College. So you can see that Indy is a distinguished, serious scientist. She also tackles big cultural questions, and maybe that is in part why she is such a distinguished scientist, because she tackles those big cultural questions. She was telling me this morning that one of her key missions, and think about how this is a cultural as well as a scientific mission, is to define the difference between environmental science and environmentalism. Maybe we'll get some insight into that big question today as we welcome Indy for her talk, Carbon Credits on the Range and in the Forest, Does It Matter? Please welcome Indy Burke. I uh, need to thank some, I've, I've had some help handing out these little clickers to you today and I, I want to recognize the help. I almost always ask graduates, my own graduate students to help, but since I didn't have my own, I borrowed some. <laughs> and we have Devin and Charlie here with us. Charlie just finished his master's at Yale, and Devin is currently working on his master's at Yale, and they're over at UCross doing some interesting e ecological work and would enjoy chatting with you at some point today, I think. So anyway, thank you for doing that. I'm starting you off with a quiz. I have to do this because my colleagues talk about, as we call it in ecology, charismatic megafauna. They talk about these beautiful big animals, and they show these pictures, and I'm talking about something else. <laughs> so I have to have a couple of gimmicks. So what I would like for you to do is to use your clickers to answer this question. You may answer as many times oops, as you like. And um, press that button anytime you like. The question is, where does most of the weight of a plant come from? One, don't answer out loud. Just press your button. This is, this is what we do with freshmen when we want to find out what they know and don't know. The soil, the sun, the atmosphere, or water. This is uh, a wonderful way to engage participants in anonymity. I don't know who you are. I didn't put names on the clickers. All right, looks like we're steady state here. We have some variability here. 10% the soil, 10% the sun, 34% the atmosphere, and 45% water. Now what I want to do is I want to uh, ask some other folks. So let's go to Harvard and see what Harvard and MIT students think. Just take three minutes. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Graduation day at Harvard and MIT. Here's a scene. Okay. okay, now hold on to that for a second. Okay. Imagine that I planted that in the ground, okay. and a tree grew. All right, and here is a piece of that tree. Sure. Okay. Now, where did all that stuff come from? So where do plants come from? You look at these beautiful big redwood trees, these great spreading valley oaks, and you know they start from this little tiny seed. It's miraculous. Where does all that weight come from? So the mass came from a lot of things, I'd guess. I'd guess from water that it sucked up from the ground. I would guess from minerals that it sucked up from the ground. Water, light, soil. Well, I, I mean, I suppose in terms of just in terms of raw mass, most of it's probably derived from actually like matter in the soil itself, and uh, some of it comes from water, obviously. Um, but a large amount of it comes from the, the nutrients that the, the, I guess, the roots uh, absorb from the soil. Now, what would you say to someone who said to you that most of the weight of the tree came from the carbon dioxide in the air? 
I would say I would have no idea. I'd have to think about that. I would disagree because this same volume of air wouldn't weigh this much unless it was highly compressed. I said that's very disturbing and um, <laughs> it's a very strange idea that somehow the air which they view as nothing, as weightless, as insubstantial, somehow makes a tree, a giant tree that weighs several tons. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be hard to believe because carbon dioxide is, well, it's a gas and it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem intuitive that you could add mass taking in a gas. But that's where it comes from. It takes those carbon molecules and packs them together via chemical reactions so tight that you get this huge mass. So what does it mean that these Harvard graduates don't understand the fundamental idea of photosynthesis? Well, it's symbolic of the state of the nation. These are the best. And the brightest. But I, you notice I cut her off at that point, despite my respect for Ivy League institutions. So what I want to do today is talk about this issue about plants taking up carbon, di carbon out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, turning it into biomass that is stored on the face of the earth, and ask some questions about why that, was, why that matters to us and what it might mean here in Wyoming and what it might not mean here in Wyoming. I hope what you got from this is that it's okay that 66% of you didn't know the right answer. To me, this is one of the most important issues facing society today, and yet it is so counterintuitive that mass on the earth comes from this, that this has mass, that turns into something very important that's stored on the surface of the earth. So that's what I want to address what today. The right answer is the atmosphere, and we will go into that. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> I, I'd like to go back and dispute your question. Because the students are always grubbing for grades. <laughs> That's just, if you would have asked the question a different way, I'd have got a better grade. <laughs> the question was the weight of plants. So, so let's just take a blade of grass. <laughs> then if you weigh that wet and dry, you're going to say water. If you're just going to say the weight of the plant, not, not the mass. Uh, uh, let's see, plant water content, Jake, 20% highest? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> They're 50, every, every, just about every organism on the planet is 50% carbon. And then there's the oxygens that also have come from the atmosphere as well. We will, we will talk about this in some detail. So today, today, today I'll talk a little bit about how carbon gets in and out of ecosystems, why it matters, uh, what that might mean for rangelands and forests in Wyoming. You've probably heard quite a bit about farming for carbon, about carbon credits. Uh, that can happen worldwide as a result of the Kyoto Protocol. And there are indeed some ranchers in Wyoming who've been receiving some payments for uh, carbon credits in Wyoming. And then I want to sort of bring it to a bottom line that is carbon stewardship for us in Wyoming. Let me just um, get back to the key question at the beginning about where does the matter come from. There was a very interesting experiment done during the 1600s by a fellow named Van Helmont who uh, planted a little willow tree in a pot, measured the soil, and then waited several years and weighed uh, the entire willow tree at the end of that time. And of course, the willow tree weighed a couple of hundred pounds, and the soil had hardly changed at all. Okay, so water had flown through, but he posited that there was some magic substance in the atmosphere that had moved into the plant and, and allowed it to gain weight, which is in fact what happens, and it is sort of magic in a way. It's chemistry, which of course is real magic. During the process of photosynthesis, because of light energy, which is not matter, but because of the energy in the sun, uh, water and carbon dioxide form carbon-carbon bonds uh, at the same time as putting oxygen into the atmosphere. So photosynthesis is fueled by energy from the sun, so when that Students said that 
the mass came from light, it was because a little bit of confusion about photosynthesis. That the sunlight provides the energy to make this chemical reaction happen, but in fact, the matter comes from the water and the carbon dioxide, which join together to form carbon-carbon bonds in any organism. And the point I want to make here is that this is really the only way that carbon gets into ecosystems is through photosynthesis. Plants are responsible for essentially all the carbon that is stored in ecosystems on Earth. One other uh, thing I, I want to point out is the role of water in photosynthesis. Water is, of course, does provide some of the material for photosynthesis, but during the process, in order to get carbon dioxide into leaves, little holes called stomata open in a leaf surface. And carbon dioxide flows in, but what happens is that there's a pipe that creates pressure from the soil all the way up. And so, because of the evaporation from that hole in the leaf tissue there, it pulls water out of the soil that goes into the atmosphere. Plants don't lose water on purpose. Plants lose water by accident. They're, those holes open for the purpose of acquiring carbon dioxide that diffuses to, in, but during that process, water diffuses out because plants are wet. So I just want to point out water loss happens by accident, and plants have processes that allow them to close those stomata, those holes, anytime it's dry, which is most of the time in Wyoming, a lot of the time in Wyoming. Soils are too dry for photosynthesis to actually occur. So water is a fundamental limitation because of the way those holes operate, those stomata operate. When it gets really dry, those close and no CO2 can get in. Carbon cycles. You saw pictures of all these um, charismatic megafauna, of all these beautiful elephants and crossbills, and I'm going to tell you that they're just carbon-carbon bombs. <laughs> okay? All those organisms, from my point of view, are just carbon. And here's the simplest view. I mean, everybody rolls their eyes when they look at carbon cycles or nitrogen cycles in science. I'm going to tell you that the only thing that matters is carbon comes in through photosynthesis and it stays in an ecosystem in live or dead material that is just carbon bonded to carbon. And it leaves through the process of respiration, which we're all doing right now. We're breaking down those carbon-carbon bonds in order to get energy so that we can sit and be very engaged in a carbon cycle lecture. <laughs> so, so, and all organisms do this, okay? All, all creatures are effectively respiring all the time. Even plants are respiring all the time. I'm not going to talk very much about this other way that carbon leaves ecosystems by the way, which is erosion, because it's sort of a displacement that goes somewhere else. Same thing actually might happen with um, logging kinds of processes. They take the carbon out of that ecosystem, but it's still on the surface of the earth and not in the atmosphere. Where's decay on that chart? Decay is right here, is in respiration. So plant material uh, dies, um, and then lots of organisms consume that dead material. Bacteria and fungi are best recognized, but there are lots of invertebrates. They chew that up, they respire it, and it goes into the atmosphere through the process of respiration. I'm going to put a few charismatic megafauna in there. There's Craig Bankman and there's Jake O'Hee. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get your clickers out again. Let's, let's, uh, this is one that um, no one is likely to have necessarily taught you, although you may have learned about photosynthesis many times. But take a guess. If you added up all the carbon on the planet, where is most of it? Is it in fossil fuel, that is coal, natural gas, oil, below the surface of the earth? Is it in the atmosphere? Is it in plants and soils? Or is it in the ocean? Fossil fuel, number one, the atmosphere, plants and soils, or the ocean? Okay, so you're kind of evenly split. Only 10% think it's fossil fuel, 33% think the atmosphere, 23% think plants and soils, and 33% think the ocean. Uh, I'll show you the graph here in a second. It is overwhelmingly the ocean, and atmosphere is very much the lowest. So let me 
you can see by how I'm showing these, by I'm using the clickers, the things that I want you to remember before lunch. So there's three times more carbon in plants and soils than there is in the atmosphere, though. So here, these numbers show the size of the pool, and these, these um, units are in gigatons, or billion metric tons. So the atmosphere has about 750 billion metric tons, and it is the smallest pool among all these. Vegetation, soil, and detritus, which is dead stuff, uh, adds up to somewhere around 2,400. So it's got, we've got more than three times as much carbon in live and dead material, organic material on the surface of the earth. Fossil fuels are 3,700. And then look at the size of some of this that's dissolved in the ocean, 37,000. Something else to look at here is that the, the largest way that carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere is through this process of photosynthesis. There's, it's dissolving. Carbon dioxide is dissolving and coming out of the ocean all the time. Let's assume for now that that's in steady state, that there's an equilibrium between the atmosphere and water. It doesn't have anything to do with biology or us, in per, per se. What's that? Uh, these are changes, anthropogenic changes, uh, cha things that are influenced by humans or by climate change. This is on the Intergovernmental Panel for, of Climate Change webpage, and I'm happy to give you any references for anything I talk about today. So my point here is that the atmosphere is a very tiny insensitive pool of carbon dioxide. It fundamentally sets the state of our climate. This is something we know from physics. And the only way CO2 regularly leaves the atmosphere is through plant action of photosynthesis. That's why I'm focusing on forests and rangelands in Wyoming. It's because this is all over the world. It's a critical process that plants do this incredible magic chemistry of photosynthesis. Why is CO2 important? Why do we want to be thinking about photosynthesis? The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. This is the long-term record that was begun in Mauna Loa, Hawaii in 1958, the year of my birth. Uh, when we started, we were below, we were about 300 parts per million. Now, uh, just this May, we hit 400 parts per million for the first time uh, that we know of in recent history. If you want to have just a feeling for what that looks like and what that increase looks like, uh, remember CO2 and the, is a small pool in the atmosphere. If you took a room that was 20 by 20 uh, feet and 9 feet high and put a person in it, this volume right here would represent the amount of carbon dioxide that was in that room, which is now 400 parts per million is about 0.4%. Is this volume here, blown up over here, shows the amount of that carbon dioxide that was actually added to the atmosphere by human activity. Not just by men, women probably had something to do with it too. So, point here is that there's this sensitive little bit of air in the atmosphere relative to the volume of the Earth. That's all the air. And this is another view of just this tiny little atmosphere over our very large Earth's surface. So it's a vulnerable part of the system that has a large impact on climate. Last year was the hottest year on record. This shows, this figure shows the difference from the average temperature from minus 0.8, from minus 8 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit across the United States for temperatures from January to December 2012. And the deeper the red, the warmer it was. So it was the hottest year on record. Climate scientists are quite convinced that this is a consequence of increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus mostly on rangelands and forests, but I just want to show you two critical things. This is the CO2 record. This is global average temperature since 1960. And this here is spring snowpack, which actually we in Wyoming think is one of the most important consequences of climate change in Wyoming. You can see that the blue lines show where there's significant spring snowpack uh, above average, and the black shows below average. And you can see we've, uh, we're decreasing the number of average years. We're generally below average in recent years. So <coughs> this is why there has been this idea of carbon credits for ecosystems. 
that we have a small pool in the atmosphere that dominates our climate and that is influenced very much by plant action on the surface of the earth. And so the question is, can we manage ecosystems to take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it? And the Kyoto Protocol, which was a number of years ago, uh, resulted in a number of countries around the planet agreeing to try to increase their carbon storage through ecosystem management and to decrease fossil fuel combustion. So let's scale down to Wyoming now and ask the question, is that something that can happen in Wyoming? I just chose uh, one reputable source, one non-reputable source, to show you that this is something that's being talked about. This is from Tree Hugger Magazine, which I promise you I don't read. I am an environmental scientist, okay, <laughs> which is different than an environmentalist. Uh, ranchers could earn carbon credits and save the world through better grazing practices. Or if you'd rather to have a credible source, this is the University of Nebraska Extension Office, which interpreted the Kyoto Protocol for ranchers in the Western United States, understanding carbon credit contact contracts for ranchers, uh, how much money can ranchers actually make from managing carbon on their land. So let's, let's just ask that question, how much carbon can be stored in ranches and forests? Now remember I pointed out that water availability is a fundamental limitation for photosynthesis because those stomata close down when there's not enough water. This is a precipitation map of Wyoming. Just to remind me to say that much of Wyoming has less than 15 to 20 inches of precipitation and much has quite a bit less precipitation, annual precipitation, than that. So we live in a state that is fundamentally limited by water availability for plant growth. So this is a diagram from my own research on grasslands and sagebrush, just asking the question, where is carbon in ecosystems? And so the size of these boxes shows where carbon is. These units are now in tons of carbon per acre. Uh, above ground plants, plant roots, or in soils. We don't necessarily need to look at numbers here. The big picture is, though, in rangelands, wow, there's a lot of carbon in the soil. And it took thousands of years to get there from there being, for many of those years, more plant production than there was respiration or release to the atmosphere. More or less at steady state right now in managed systems, as I'll show you. So even within the plants, there's only a tenth as much carbon in the above ground parts, the leaves, as there is in the roots in rangeland systems. So we can think of rangelands as being upside down forests. A lot of the activity is going on below the surface of the earth. That's where the carbon is, that's where the decomposers are, that's where the live uh, invertebrates are who are making a living below the surface of the earth. Well, what does that mean for managing a system? So let's, let's just take some guesses here. If I plow this rangeland, what happens to the total carbon if I plant it into wheat? What are you going to do with the plant material that's already there? Uh, what a farmer would, would normally do if they're plowing out is just run right over the existing system the way it was. So it would get, so the, uh, the grass on the top would get incorporated into the soil, which was being mixed at the time. Okay, four of you are being sort of thinking about this here. One is gain carbon and two is lose carbon. I always have this trouble when I give exams. They say that exam is too long. I can't finish it in the time you gave me. <laughs> okay, about half and half uh, between those two. Now, um, the reason one might say gain carbon would be because you're planting this plant that is a spring plant cool season plant that puts a lot of green biomass above ground, right? So it looks like there's more carbon there. In fact, because you break up the soil when you till, and you mix that above ground biomass, and you kill all those roots, you stimulate the decomposers, you stimulate the bacteria and fungi, which means that respiration or decomposition of that soil speeds up by an order of magnitude, by 10 times. 
<laughs> and so you, I mean, you, it looks green. It looks great. But what happens is you dramatically lose soil carbon during those first few years. And um, this was not recognized for a long time. So here's what about what that looks like when you cultivate the system. You have a well-managed grassland that is at more or less steady state. You plow it, and you can lose up to 50% in the of the carbon in the first two decades after plowing because the soil gets mixed regularly, and it speeds up that decomposition rate. Unfortunately, you can speed up respiration much faster than you can speed up photosynthesis. And I'll give you the analogy is spending money versus earning money. It's a lot easier to spend your money fast than it is to earn money quickly. And in the case of photosynthesis, it's a fundamental biological constraint based upon how much water is available and how much photosynthesis can happen. So we look at systems that, for instance, get plowed out and put into the conservation reserve program. They can lose almost a ton an acre per year of carbon, but then they can only recover very, very, very slowly at a rate uh, at most that is a quarter that rate. A uh, conservation reserve program oftentimes is taking lands out of tillage and putting them into perennial grasses. So that could be, that might be an analogy for when you would do this. So you stop tilling, you start putting it into recovery, and it's a great thing for recovery. You increase soil organic matter, albeit slowly, you increase habitat for wildlife, but don't get your hopes up too much about how fast you're going to gain carbon because it took thousands and thousands of years to get here. Photosynthesis is just limited by water availability in these systems. So something we might say about this is that any management practice we use that only focuses on above ground, like grazing, or even fire in a, in a rangeland, doesn't do much to the carbon dynamics in a rangeland system. But if we focus a disturbance here through tillage, through mining, through overgrazing, you can very rapidly lose your soil carbon content. So there's large stores of carbon in rangelands that are mostly in the soils, and it takes thousands of years to get there. Yes? Do certain plants have more carbon than others? I'm going to give you the extreme answer and tell you not much. Um, that as an ecosystem ecologist, I have a green slime model of the world. And it works pretty well for models to say, well, you know, as long as you've got a plant there, it's okay. It's not exactly true. It helps if the plant evolved in the system that it's growing in. It tends to be a better carbon capture if it's a nat native plant. It's a great question. Uh, carbon stays essentially constant under reasonable, well-managed grazing systems, unless the soil is disturbed, in which case, like money, carbon is lost much more easily than it's gained. And gaining is dependent entirely on how much water is available. So just an example of the worst case scenario, this is a, a photo from the Dust Bowl, where it was a combination not only of tillage-induced decomposition, but also erosion losses. I mean, Washington, D.C. benefited from our soils here. Uh, here's an example of overgrazing, where lots of soil can be lost through overgrazing. And this is really a, an extreme example of an impact of overgrazing. So let's just do a little bit with forests here. Uh, this is actually near my home. And I look out there and I think, man, that's a lot of carbon. Um, so let's just look at what that diagram looks like. And just, you can sort of squint at this, really. And what you can see is that above and below ground biomass are the dominant places where the carbon is. Most of the carbon in a forest is in the tree. And there's a little bit in the soil. So this now, to me, as an ecosystem scientist, says, wow, man, if I want to hurt carbon in that system, I need to do something to the above ground biomass. I need to do something to the standing boles of the trees. 
By the way, the total amount of biomass in a forest is higher. It's not just because it's trees. It's because the forests grow in places where there's more water. So let's do a last clicker question. Which results in most lo loss of carbon from a lodgepole forest? Let's just guess here. Beetle kill, clear cuts, or a forest fire? So this would be standing stocks for those of you who are thinking about clear cuts and moving, just moving the carbon somewhere else. Let's just think about what's left on the ground. Uh, this is any lodgepole pine forest in Wyoming. So someplace, say, between 8,300 feet and 10,000 feet in elevation. Okay, wow, another pretty even split. Beetle kill, clear cuts, and forest fire. And before I show you some diagrams that show just a little bit of the data that we do have, um, it's a timing question. This one was another one where I didn't really quite give enough information to ask the question. Somebody could have said over how many years, right? <laughs> In which case it might have all been the same because the trees are dying, right? And they'll decompose when they go away. But beetle kill uh, it takes a kind of a long time. I mean, the, the trees die and the needles are still hanging there and then they got to fall before they decompose. In terms of the, your impression of the system, it looks dead, it looks like nothing's happening. Um, it doesn't look green and you might think that's a loss of carbon, but actually the carbon's still there. It's just not live and functioning. Clear cuts removes the carbon. That's why I might have said this one uh, for what's left. And forest fire, I'll show you a photo, and we'll talk about that a little bit. With logging, it's a sudden change, right? Because the trees are cut down, many are taken away. It depends upon whether it's a clear cut, how much is left, slash is left on the ground. And then there's a relatively slow recovery. So it's a rapid, large rate, 16.2 tons on average over lodgepole pines uh, in Wyoming, uh, with a rate of about half or a tenth as much coming back each year because it takes time for the new seedlings to establish to get leaf area out when there's enough leaf area then photosynthesis can be fast so it takes a long time to start really grabbing much carbon back but they do come back I got so interested in this carbon question I got a, I got a grant to study this because after a forest fire this is actually um, just a few weeks ago behind my house which no longer looks like the first <laughs> photograph um, that's a lot of carbon left, isn't there? Forest fires actually uh, focus on the fine needles and the, um, the fine branches, leaving a lot of carbon behind, and that takes a long time to decompose and go, fall down, decompose and go away. And same thing with the roots below ground. So we might say, uh, and there's an estimate of about eight tons or half as much as clear cut that's lost right away. Then things gradually decompose so carbon goes down for a while before it starts to come back up again at this relatively slow rate. And for beetles, you know, carbon loss is pretty slow. There's some graduate students at University of Colorado studying this now and they say, boy, it's hard to even measure carbon loss from a beetle killed forest because you just got a lot of dead stuff standing there and it takes a long time for it to truly decompose. Combustion by fire can really get rid of it quickly, uh, or, or removal, but uh, decomposition itself can be relatively slow if it's undisturbed. So the bottom line for Wyoming, you know, we get, we have, I'm going to, can we make money farming carbon in, in Wyoming? Most rangelands and forests are pretty steady with respect to carbon. Let's say most of the forests are not under beetle kill. Let's say most of the forests are not burned. Let's say most of the area is being relatively well managed for grazing. Carbon's more or less pretty steady. And biology is really slow in Wyoming because it's dry. It just is the way it is. It's the recovering rangelands in the state that are actually increasing in carbon content. So if I were selling carbon credits, I wouldn't go to well-managed rangelands that have always been managed well. I would go to places that had been very severely damaged because those are the places where there's a capacity to increase in carbon. So it's a real paradox in some ways. So let's, but let's look at, I gave you some numbers for how fast, let's look at what those numbers might look like. I mean, how much money could you make in terms of carbon dioxide credits? This is what's happened with the CO2 um, 
markets over since 2005. It's been very volatile. It's almost impossible to get a number today for the United States because the carbon uh, exchange market has collapsed in the United States. I did get a number, a dollar fifteen, but nobody's trading in U.S. carbon and ecosystems today. But policies might change, and they could in the future. In terms of euros, it's five in Europe. If you convert to U.S. dollars, it's five dollars and forty cents per ton of carbon dioxide. Dave, how much is the carbon loss? that carbon that leaves that particular area you're talking about and goes into the atmosphere? It goes into the atmosphere, yeah, and good. You're talking about gaining, that's carbon coming out of the atmosphere going into that spot. Perfect, okay. yep. So my understanding has been that if I wanted to go into the business of stockpiling carbon, then what i do is I'd start off with an old growth forest, which is no longer absorbing carbon. It's basically saving. I would cut that forest down and I would make sure that it does not go back into the atmosphere by putting those forest products into log cabins. And landfills. Timber. Whatever. Yeah. I'd stockpile it over here. Yeah. And then the new growth forest that's going to come behind it is going to be very hungry and is going to soak up carbon at a huge rate until it starts to mature, which that rate goes down, eventually becomes an old growth forest. It's no longer soaking up carbon. I cut that down. So basically the cycle is to continue to clear cut old growth forests and stockpile the carbon in a sink that's not allowed to go back in the atmosphere. Yep. Is that fundamentally sound? That's right. It's fundamentally sound and it works great in tropical rainforests and the Pacific Northwest. Why not somewhere else? Water is the fundamental constraint for photosynthesis. In places where there's enough water, then other nutrients become limiting. Uh, but under, um, uh, what's a thousand millimeters? Quick, Yale guys, what's a thousand millimeters in inches? <laughs> How many? Divided by 2.5. Oh, yeah, I do the math. <laughs> 40, 40 inches? Okay. 40 inches? Okay, so uh, less than 40 inches. You're so limited by water that you can't even, you, I mean, it's not worth it. To do it. But over that, boy, you can, yeah, you can do that in wet places, which is a sort of a bottom line message here, um, is that that strategy of cutting down your forest, saving the wood somewhere, making sure that car, you know, putting in the bottom of the ocean, whatever you do with it, saving it on the, bottom, on the, on the surface of the earth or below, and then growing more to take it out of the atmosphere is a perfect strategy, probably not in Wyoming. So I did some calculations of how much money you could make. I calculated per acre in carbon dioxide units. Now, so I did change units if you're looking at numbers because that's what I could calculate the numbers with here. Here's the volume of carbon dioxide that could be stored in a degraded rangeland. So it's coming back per year, 90 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. Next to a person, you can see how much that is. That's 11 cents an acre a year. It's not worth uh, engaging in the market too much for. Or if you were selling your credits to the European market, you could get 50 cents an acre. If you owned private forests that you were allowing to recover in Wyoming, it's much higher. It's uh, more than three times higher, four times higher almost exactly. 3.6 tons of carbon dioxide per acre per year. You could get $4.20 in the U.S. market right now for that or almost $20 on the European market for that. Again, for, uh, for a whole acre, that's not too much money. I did some other interesting calculations just to give you, you know, how much carbon is that? Okay, dollars, that's interesting. How much carbon is that relative to how much leaves Wyoming in coal in a given year? So here's the change per acre on rangelands. Here's the change per acre maximum for forests. <laughs> and here, then I took all the coal that's exported from Wyoming in a given year and I divided it by the number of acres. acres of, of Wyoming. So I spread out all of Wyoming's coal pr production over the whole state. And you can see it's about four times higher than the maximum amount of rate that we think we could absorb from the atmosphere. Now, we certainly aren't responsible for combusting all this carbon dioxide, all this coal. 
fact, we're only responsible for a tiny proportion of that. But in case we were thinking about offsetting our own fossil fuel carbon combustion with biological resources, we can see we're not that, we don't have that capacity. I was almost finished writing this talk and my husband sent me this paper yesterday, published in Australia where they came up with the same conclusions I have. The potential for carbon sequestration in Australian agricultural soils is technically and economically limited and they come up with the same conclusion that it's a, it's a biological limitation of photosynthesis. You just can't capture enough carbon and it's not worth it on the market. So let's say you own land and you really want to bring in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. What's the only way you could do that? Watering. Excellent. And let's, let's use the use word, use water to increase photosynthesis because if you were to plant cottonwoods in a riparian area with the purpose of capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, your streams just might dry up. In fact, they very likely would because that water would be sucked up into the roots to meet the suction going out the stomata and go into the atmosphere. So just in finishing, I want to suggest a different approach for Wyoming, which has to do with stewarding the resources of carbon we have now. So we could ask that question in a different way. How much carbon is stored? What about not being paid to get more carbon in, but what about thinking about what we can do to just keep the carbon we have and a role for valuing what that is? Here's an estimate of all the carbon in all the rangelands in Wyoming, 1.4 gigatons. All Wyoming forests, 2 gigatons. And all the reserves of Wyoming coal, 14.5 gigatons of carbon stored in all the reserves. Now this is not insignificant compared to this uh, right here. And certainly, were we to lose this amount of carbon, it could have a dramatic effect on atmospheric carbon dioxide. Added together, these here uh, represent about the annual production of, car of fossil fuels into the atmosphere worldwide. So my bottom line here is that Wyoming stores a lot of carbon, and that has great value, and that stewarding that carbon carefully is probably our best action to take. Thank you.